Hey guys, this is a new thing I'm trying out, uh, specifically exclusively for the Patreon. This is kind of a photo department behind the scenes video series I'm gonna start doing. I don't think that's what I wanna call it. I think it'd be fun to have like a contest or a vote on what would be a cooler name for the series. Uh, basically what I wanna do is show stuff that I do uh, pretty often, uh, like processing film, scanning film, uh, going out and shooting, uh, how I choose to shoot certain films, you know, stuff that I get a lot of questions about that, uh, it's just easier to show sometimes. Aaron in the discord has, uh, on a few occasions, most recently today, asked me, uh, about C41 processing, how I kind of go about it. And I thought it'd be helpful for him and everyone else. If I just show you guys, I've got some chemicals. They are up to temp, I think. 102.7, 102.9. Okay, so let me give you a little primer on kind of my, uh, my methodology behind um, how I process C41 film. You guys are aware that I, I've stand developed C41 before and I've talked about how I've gotten really good results. And um, ever since doing that, I've been modifying my C41 normal process um, involving, you know, the water bath and the, the developer roller guy because I've realized that C41 processing and pretty much all film processing um, within specific parameters is pretty forgiving and is not super as exacting as you might expect it to be. So I have dialed in my process in a very loose way to accommodate kind of everything. And all of the color film, uh, slide film and black and white film that I have posted on Instagram, on my website, on uh, the Discord, on the Patreon have all been processed by me here at home uh, using this process. So clearly it works. <laughs> yeah, so right from the get go, this is what I use most of the time the Cinestill um, 2 bath color simplified uh, chemicals. You can get Kodak chemicals straight from Kodak. You can get like, you know, more intensive systems that have more broken out chemicals. You can get the Blix and uh, the Fixer separately. And if you're doing like archival stuff, and if you're, you know, doing something that's really, really intensive that you really, really want your negatives to like last forever or be archival quality, uh, you can definitely do that. I've been doing it this way or with the Tetanol kit or the Ultra Color um, powder kits for a long, long time. And I still have a lot of those uh, negatives and none of them have degraded over the last 15 years. So I don't think it's uh, that necessary or important. Uh, so yeah, so I start with uh, the C41 kit. I like to use the liquid kit just because it's easy to use, not necessarily because it's better. The powder kits work really well. Just mixing the liquid kits is just much easier but everything goes into these jobo um 1000 mil uh, containers i like these because they're black they're square or rectangular so they store really really easily and uh i think they look kind of slick i like the graphic design on that they're like 11 bucks a piece uh but um i think they're worth the investment if you want to go cheaper and you want something that's also going to be just as good these amber bottles i got from amazon i think it was 12 bucks for a pack of three um, just make sure you get the wide mouth ones. I have a mix of wide mouth and like regular. Um, the wide mouth ones are much easier to use. But these ones will store your chemicals and keep UV off of them as well. So uh, these are really good. I just find that the round bottles don't store as easy. Um, but I've been using these for a long time and I've just recently switched all of my chemistry over to uh, the Jobo kits. So yeah, either one works really great. This one's the more economical and easy to get version. Uh, the Jobo ones are kind of like if you have some extra cash and you really want to have the storability, it's a good way to go. Reels. Uh, these are the, these aren't the Patterson reels. These are like the other ones. Shit, who makes these? Film reels. Okay. Ah, yeah. So I do have uh, a couple of these Patterson auto whatever reels but i don't like that it's just like open in the middle it's hard to kind of find um if you're in a hurry or if um uh your film 
is cut weird from the canister or there's like something wrong or just f for a variety of reasons i'm not like super into this one i think it's harder to locate and to begin um so i just have this one as a backup i don't use it all that often um what i'm usually using are these reels these are made by uh ap i think i think these are the ap reels the reason i like these reels is that they're 100 percent compatible with the patterson tanks and uh they're adjustable to many sizes i use the 120 and 35 millimeter sizes obviously uh but they have this kind of like platform lip thing that especially in 35 you know they're really close together it's really easy to locate which side to put in and how to start the film it kind of doesn't it's like really hard to screw it up so um i use these all the time i've been using them for years and i really 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 like them. I use them in my Patterson tank. This is the three reel, uh, multi-use reel and tank, three reel tank. Yes, yeah, so this is the multi-use three tank. This is the tank I use most often because I'm using the Cinestill uh, quart kits and this fits a thousand milliliters perfectly. But I also have, um, this is the five wheel or five reel. Yeah, multi-reel five tank. I also use this tank, um, but this needs, um, more chemistry so if i were to do you know each roll of 120 needs 500 mils of chemistry so if i do three rolls i need 1500 mils so this this is you know also really great i use this often as well uh, not as often but um it's great if you need to process a lot at once and if you have the chemistry for it for four by five the bees four by five reel it's a uh you know, uh, I'll put the link in the description or in the post. Um, it's just a 3D printed reel he made. It works really good. It's easy to scratch your negatives if you're not careful, but if you are careful, these work super good. 100% compatible with the Patterson takes. Okay, so for the um, for the water bath, this is just a 12 quart uh, cube by Cambro. I got this at a um, restaurant supply company. Uh, here in Milwaukee, it was like 10 bucks and it's the perfect size and shape for, you know, three or four bottles. I have the two for C41 right now. It works really great. I, there's round ones, there's other sizes you can get, but this one works um, great for what I'm doing. And then I have this is the Kilitos, 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 I don't know, uh, sous vide. Um, I broke my last sous vide that I got from Amazon. So I bought this one's like 49 bucks. I'm not super in love with it. I don't like the interface. Uh, the It's like flat buttons uh, and they're not very intuitive. They don't like react very well to touch. So it's not my favorite, but it's been working for the last couple months. So I just keep with this. Um, I'm probably gonna get a better one at some point, but I haven't really needed to do that. So I'm not doing that just now. So yeah, I just deal with that. Um, this is something you absolutely need. It's a Thermo Pro. Well, mine is a Thermo Pro Plus um, thermometer. You don't need to have a fancy thermometer. This one I think was mm, $12 on Amazon. I like it because it's instant read. It gives me an instant read on um, the temperature. Oh. For processing film and agitating, I use the Bees processor. This was uh, about a hundred bucks when I bought it. Uh, he still makes them. It's really great. It has three different speeds uh, and it has um, different wheels. So right now I have these wheels on it, which are irregular. So they kind of like make the film tank bounce a bit, which agitates a little bit better. And then you can also swap them out for um, regular round wheels, which will be smooth. Oh, I think my laundry is done. And this is my favorite piece of equipment for processing film. This is not necessary. You don't need to go buy one of these. I bought this because um, when I learned proper darkroom and processing techniques, I was in college. We had our old darkrooms and we had a bunch of these in it. Um, and this was what we timed all of our processing and everything. It just is familiar and nostalgic and reminds me of learning film for the first time when I was in college. So it's a Gra, Gra Labs, Gra Labs darkroom timer. It has um, outlets for safe lights or an enlarger. I use the bottom one. Um, and basically what it does is when you turn this on and it has time on it, 
uh, you turn the timer on, it'll also turn on this outlet, which will turn on the agitating uh, processor. So when it stops and the buzzer goes off, it stops agitating at the same time, which is very convenient. Um, so yeah, this is like nostalgic. You don't need this, but I really love this thing. As far as temperature goes in the Cinestill instruction booklet, uh, for processing color film, it's going to tell you that uh, 102 degrees Fahrenheit or 39 degrees Celsius is the optimal temperature to process C41, uh, and that is absolutely true. But when the tank is on the agitator, on the bees processor, uh, it's not being heated by the water tank anymore. In my experiments, what I have found is if the average temperature of the chemical stays around 102 over the entirety of the development time specifically, you're good to go. Typically what I'll do is I'll heat the chemicals a bit above um, where I want it to be. So if I want 102 for C41, I'm going to get the water up to 103 or 103.5 so that when it goes into the tank and on the processor for three and a half minutes, uh, over those three and a half minutes is gonna lose some heat, but it's not gonna dip below 102 or at least not very far. And then the average over that time will be pretty close to 102. So we'll be good. I found that, that works really great and I haven't had any issues with uh, anything at all since I've done that. So that's what we're gonna do today. I encourage you if you're going to do any kind of home processing that you experiment, try things out, find what works for you. Because like I said, it's really forgiving. And for your specific situation, it might just be easier to do things a different way. Like if you can't afford to buy a sous vide, you just gotta use tap water. Get the tap water to be a little bit above 102. And then when you're doing the processing by hand, you'll be good to go. Space permitting, uh, you can do something like this with a water bath, but if you don't have a space like this, you gotta get creative, experiment. Okay, sorry if the sound gets wonky, I gotta like move around and do stuff. I'm gonna probably just leave the camera here because I don't wanna move it around a bunch, but I'm gonna show you what I'm doing uh, as I'm going, step by step. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get this water from the tap up to about 102, 103, and then I'm gonna do my pre-soak. So the reason I'm using tap water, not distilled water, is because in my experiments, I have not seen a large or even discernible difference in using tap water versus mineral or distilled water. I'm sure for certain circumstances we have really, really hard water, it's gonna make a difference, but it just hasn't. I even tried using distilled water through the entire process once and I still got water droplets or streaks. Um, I think there's just a balance between water that's not too mineral related and a good drying process for your film after the fact, which we'll get to. Can you read that? 102.2-ish. Um, it's not gonna stay there. Uh, but with developing, especially the, the development step, uh, a little bit hotter is always better than cooler, um, but you don't wanna go too hot or you can overdevelop, which will cause contrasty negatives. If it's too cool, then you can get really muddy shadows and like gross, really flat negatives. So I would say anywhere between 102 to 104 and a half is probably okay. Um, this water is gonna fluctuate in temperature. Uh, so I'm gonna get it close and then get the water in quickly. I should spool the film up first, probably. So today I'm processing a roll of Silbera 160 that Jackie, AKA Sour Cream US shot today in her Pentax K1000. And this is a roll of the new Kodak Gold in 120 that I also shot today. I shot this uh, one stop underexposed. So I shot at 400 because I want to see what it looks like a stop underexposed. Uh, I'm not going to push because I'm doing two different um, what is this film? I'm doing two different rolls of film that this one was not pushed or underexposed. This one was actually overexposed by about uh, two thirds of a stop. So this is gonna be normal processing, mostly because I wanna see how this film does in that um, scenario. So these will both be processed in the same tank normally, no push. Okay, I've got the film in the tank. Now we can proceed. As far as like spooling your film on reels, I don't do anything special. I just do it 
the normal way. I use a can opener to get 35 millimeter canisters open. And oftentimes I'll just spool the leader in first and then spool it that way. And then I, I'll cut or I'll just like rip the tape off the end um, for 35 millimeter and then 120, same thing. I open it up the first, the front, I guess the end goes in first and I'll spool it in and then take the tape off the edge of the uh, film from the backing paper. Just, you know, also I just use a regular changing bag that sucks, I gotta get a new one. Um, this magnet that's on here with this rubber band is for the um, bees processor. It'll, uh, these magnets will help the processor see when it's rotated once and then it'll rotate the opposite direction. It's actually really smart that way, so very cool. Um, but yeah, now you can put uh, water in. If you're gonna do a pre-rinse, which I recommend you do, um, do it at the same temperature as a developer, so 102 degrees. I do a pre-wash for a minute. I don't think it's necessary. I used to do C41 without doing a pre-wash, but I like it because it washes the anti-halation layer off and that clears my developer so it doesn't turn a weird color too soon. Um, and I just enjoy that. You don't have to do a pre-wash, but I find that it's, um, gives me a peace of mind. So I do a pre-wash for a minute and I use the agitator just to make sure it gets all that anti-halation layer off. There's the alarm. Stops there. And check this out. I don't know if you can see this, but check the color of the... Oh. Kind of like pea colored. Okay, so right after I do the pre-wash, developer goes in. I've already checked the temperature of the developer, so we're perfect there. You'll see that it's kind of a darker color. I don't know if you can see that. It's like kind of like a tea color. Uh, if it gets much darker than this, it's time to change it. So, developer goes in. Top goes on, push down in the center so that all suction, whatever, that goes in. Three and a half minutes for C41. Uh, if it's fresh chemistry, I've used about 15 rolls through this, so I'm gonna do uh, three minutes and 45 seconds. And we're off. You'll notice that I didn't really rush to get the chemistry in there, nor did I like freak out over the timing of everything. Um, if you're relatively careful and are paying attention, it's not mission critical to like uh, hit all the timings perfectly. It's going to be okay. So uh, that's going to be three minutes and 45 seconds. And then when that is done, we'll, uh, blick stage. Okay, developer's done. Back into the developer bottle. Sometimes if I pour too fast, I'll get suds. So, you know, slow down. It's not the end of the world. Suds are gone. Okay, Blix. The cool thing about Blix is you can't really over Blix. Blix for eight minutes. I guess you can over Blix technically if you left your film in Blix for like an hour. Uh, but typically, as long as you're not leaving it in for an hour, you're probably fine. Sinistel says Blix for eight minutes. I stick to that. Uh, developer will want you to add more time as more rolls go through the chemistry. Blix, not so much. You can kind of use it because Blix either works or it doesn't. It doesn't like degrade over time, at least not in a dramatic fashion like uh, developer does. Okay. Okay, so I moved the camera over here, so I figured it'd be easier for you to see what I'm doing. Uh, at about a minute and a half, I like to get the tap water to about 100-ish degrees uh, for my after Blix rinse. Um, it doesn't need to be super hot, it just needs to be warmer than lukewarm. Um, I find that it helps to rinse away the Blix easier if it's warmer, uh, but it doesn't need to be 102. The Blix doesn't even need to be 102. The Blix could be between 80 and 100 degrees, um, or it could be 102 if you want for continuity, but it doesn't have to be. 
The only thing that needs to be 102 uh, average is the developer. That's it. So yeah, I'm around 102-ish for the rinse. That's great. Uh, we've got about a minute and 15 left on the timer, as you can see. I'm not in focus. Now I'm in focus. I'm not in the middle of the frame. Okay. Is this quality content? I sure hope so. I hope this is worth your investment. So you can see the Deity logo, so you know that I use cool microphones. About 20 seconds left. Let's make sure. See, water fluctuated, got a little hot. Okay. That's the uh, buzzer. See? Turns off the uh, processor. Isn't that cool? So I usually give the little rinse because there's flicks all over it. Flix goes back in. This step I don't have to rush. I can go nice and slow because the Blix has already done all the blixing. It's not going to Blix too far. Klaus. Okay, then boom. Into the running water. Close the Blix. Am I going to be processing more film today? No. So I can take my chems out, unplug my sous vide. Set all that shit aside. Put that aside, and then I'm gonna dump my water carefully into the sink. I like to rinse it, because there's usually a little bit of blicks that gets on it. But we're good. Oh, I turned the water off like a moron. Okay, so after blicks, uh, what I like to do is I fill I fill it all the way up with water and you can't really see it. It's not super necessary that you do. But then once it fills up with water once, I take off the funnel, stick it aside, and then I just pull both the reels out. I'm like, oh, look at that. Film. There's, there's photos on here. But I dump that out, get all the extra blicks out, and then I give the tank a bit of a rinse, and then I rinse off the reels and film, like so, and then back in. So I rinse this uh, a handful of times where I fill it all the way up, dump it, fill it all the way up, dump it, um, probably like five or six times, uh, just to make sure there's no more blicks left. And I like to, I like to agitate it. that a couple times. Gotta get that Blix out of there. It's gross. You should drink Blix for health, but don't you don't want it hanging out on your film after you're done. So yeah, once the Blix step is done, um, you are light safe, so you can open it once you're done with the Blix. You don't have to wait to open it. As soon as the Blix is out, or as soon as the Blix cycle is done, you can open the tank. Um, I just like to dump a bunch of water in first before I open it. Uh, it's it, kind of a ritual. It, there's no real reason to do it that way, but that's just how I do it. Um, you don't have to do it the same way. You can do it completely differently, but that's just how I like to do it. So... How's everyone Saturday going? This isn't live. All right, after I'm done rinsing, I'm gonna fill it up one last time. Okay, once that is filled with rinsed film clean water, this is Kodak PhotoFlow 2000. Basically, uh, the ingredients, it's hexamine. Where's the ingredients? This contains octophenoxyethanol. Octo it causes serious eye it, uh, problems. It'll irritate your eyes a bunch. So don't get this in your eyes. You can get it on your hands, but then don't touch your eyes because then it'll irritate your eyes. But uh, this is basically the same shit that you get with the Sinistil kit. Um, where is it? This stuff, the uh, rinse bath, final rinse stuff. Um, this is the same. So this is one type, this is a different type. This is uh, hexamine. This is the other one. So they're both 
photo flow. And what it does is that it breaks the surface tension of the water so that the water um, doesn't leave streaks on your film and it also helps to kind of like preserve the emulsion or whatever. So you only need a very little amount. Um, you're doing like this much to a thousand milliliters for the Cinestill kit, but I like to use this stuff. Um, I just do like a third of a cap full, maybe even less. That goes right in there and it will make suds, but you wanna, you wanna kinda like gently agitate it for about 15 seconds. Um, and then you're gonna let it sit for about a minute. Um, and that's going to help the film. That's going to make uh, the tones crispy, er, crispier than they already are. Uh, and they're gonna make you, um, you're gonna get about two to 3,000 more followers um, just from that step alone. So I recommend doing that every time. But uh, I'm gonna let that sit for a minute and I'm gonna go prep my hanging thing. Uh. Okay, PhotoFlow or the final wash is gonna have some bubbles and suds in it. Don't worry, that's not a problem. Uh, you are going to be squeegeeing the film anyway, so the suds are not really an issue. So after a minute, you can reuse, by the way, uh, if you do a dilution of a thousand milligrams of this stuff from the Sinistel kit, you can reuse it as long as you have the kit. Um, but I do a one shot with this stuff because I use so little. So I've got my film. What I like to do for my final last thing is I take it in my right hand and I just dip. I dip the entire thing in, into the photo flow. I get my fingers wet, I pull it out, and then I do a squeegee. And sometimes I'll turn it around the other way. Um, this is like completely unnecessary. This is what I like to do. Sometimes I'll put it in the opposite way, give it a little, give it a little dunk, and then I squeegee the top all the way down to the bottom to get uh, most of the water off. Ooh, Silbera. We, we love, we love Silbera in this household. Um, it's always really nice. Oh, it's only 24 exposure roll. I thought it was 36. Okay. Okay, excuse the shitty audio, we're in my bathroom now, but this is how I hang uh, my film. I have these uh, weird kind of tie hangers I got a long time ago from my mom when she was moving actually. And then I put a uh, binder clip uh, or this bulldog clip on there and then I hang the film from there. And then on the bottom, I have another bulldog clip for some weight, same for 35 millimeter. It's not, you know, probably there's probably better ways to do this, but this works fine for me. Uh, has been working fine for a long time. So, yeah. And then usually, I'll uh, take my girl, I'll take my girlfriend's hair dryer and dry them because I have no, um, I have no patience, and uh, it works. Oftentimes, I'll take a shower or turn the shower on like right before I'm gonna do chemicals or I'll turn the shower on right before I'm gonna do some film and that way the dust is kind of out of the air. Um, we took showers not that long ago so there's not a lot of dust in the air here. But um, now I'm going to use the hair dryer to dry them. Uh, I found that if you use a hair dryer to dry them or some kind of heating drying technique, you get flatter negatives in general. So I haven't really had um, curled negative issues since using a hair dryer. On the low setting, don't cook your negatives. It's easy to do that. That's it. Um, all I'm gonna do now is clean up. Uh, I, that's literally how I process C41 all the time. There's no tricks or weird things that I do. A big part of it is uh, the bees processor. This thing uh, at a hundred bucks is a really great bargain. The guy who makes it um, is a really cool, knowledgeable guy uh, who um, 
you know, makes also makes the uh, four by five reels and he makes some other things too. Um, really great stuff. I'll put the link to his Instagram and, and uh, website in the, uh, in the post. So you guys can check that stuff out. Uh, that, that thing really does make this process so much easier because I can be doing other things while that's agitating. I don't have to sit there and look at the, the, the clock the entire time and like agitate. And uh, it just, it really does make everything a lot easier. Plus it's very consistent, which is super cool. Um, but like I said, uh, processing film is very, very easy and forgiving. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, so it seems like second nature to me, but to take some experimentation and practice. Klaus, get down, get down. God damn it, but you can do this. You can do this and you can be good at it. If you have any questions, drop them below. I will be happy to answer them. Um, did I forget anything? I don't think I did. I'll do something like this for stand development uh, for black and white. I might do a color stand development one as well. Uh, if I do any like more how to's as far as that, um, or if I do any more like, you know, stand development stuff or whatever, I'm probably going to release those for the channel because a lot of people have been asking me about that. I did want to give you guys kind of a behind the scenes of how I do this since you guys have been asking. So I hope this was helpful to some of you. Thank you for watching. Um, I will do uh, a video on my behind the scenes of scanning and editing at some point. Um, soon, probably, because I think I have my scanning set up dialed in pretty perfect. Um, so yeah, thanks again. I'll see you guys in Discord.